I obviously continue to make more videos around the economic cycles and cryptocurrency, which mishmash our portfolios into this fantastic thing, which we're gonna see massive growth on in the coming years. It's not financial advice, but it is advice to hit the like button and subscribe. Let's get on with the video. Hey guys, it's Jason Pizzino. Welcome back to another video. Today's video, we're gonna go and take a turn from Bitcoin and crypto into the economic market cycles. And the reason for doing this is so we can keep a track of where we are positioned overall in the economic market. So what I'm talking about here is stuff like the stock market and the property market in particular, because these are the two biggest areas that people like to invest their money in. It's like the biggest areas that people wanna buy assets in. And of course, this then leads over to our portfolio. And like with most of you here, I assume uh, like to invest in cryptocurrency like myself. This also plays a particular part in all of those spheres. And what I mean by this is when it comes to the news and the fundamental information that we hear in the everyday world and on the news, on YouTube, news articles on the internet, we tend to see a lot of the same thing happen at the same time, which is generally what we shouldn't be doing. For example, in downturns, we hear a lot of bad news. There's just bad news everywhere. And the bad news affects the market and generally it goes down a bit more. In the good times, we hear a lot of good news and the market continues to rise up. But what we don't see in the bad times is when we get good news out, the market doesn't really move from that point. And we could see this in the Bitcoin rise of 2017 and that huge bull market. As the bull market was going up, the good news pushed the market higher. As the bad news came out, the market kind of just took a bit of a pause. But as the economic cycle turned, or I guess as the market cycle for Bitcoin turned, the bad news pushed the market down and the good news couldn't do much to hold it up and it generally just fell a little slower than it originally did. So what I like to do is put the two together. We're talking about economic cycles and markets in particular, just understanding how their cycle works generally. And then also looking at human psychology at different times in the market to try and figure out what it is that we should do. And we are affected a lot by news. So that's why I brought up at the beginning of the video, talking a lot about the news and the market and the cycles and where we are in it. And depending on where we are in the cycle, the news will do something different. The important part here for me, and you know, that's why I'm sharing it with you guys, is to try and cut through the noise. So I wanna make a big disclaimer here. I'm gonna present a few things that I look at on the internet. There are some channels that I enjoy watching and there are some that I don't necessarily don't enjoy, but I don't agree with their view on the economic cycle. And the reason for bringing this up is to try and cut through the noise. So for example, there is a YouTube channel that I enjoy watching, I appreciate uh, his content, and the channel is called Meet Kevin. What I wanna do by analyzing these channels is to bring it back to the noise factor and how much of this should we actually take into consideration when considering where we are on the economic cycle. So if you haven't heard of it or seen it already, I'm talking about the 18.6 year property cycle, which is tied into the stock market cycle, which overall drives us in the direction that we are going to go. I've spoken about the cycle many times on the channel before, so I'll leave a few cards up throughout the video. And of course, at the end of the video, there'll be some videos there for you to go and watch. One in particular, I've discussed the cycle in detail, and it comes a lot from the book here of Phil Anderson's The Secret Life of Real Estate and Banking. Now that's my scabby looking uh, cover for the book because it's a beautiful hardcover book here, you can see there. I'll leave a link for this book in the description. You can pick that up. I don't have an affiliate li link with it yet, but I'll work on that. So maybe you'll see that in the future to have a, an affiliate link with Amazon. The book's about 50 Aussie dollars, so probably 30, 35 US completely worth every single cent of that book. It goes through and covers over 200 years of property cycle history from the US, which then leads to everything else in the market. I digress a little bit from that. I'm not gonna go through and explain that all again because I do that quite often in many of the other videos and I will have a video coming up in future that talks about the cycle and exactly where we are and how you can understand where we are in the cycle so that it can lead to pretty much what I see as stress-free investing. When I know where I am in the cycle, it helps so much to make a decision, leave it for a few years knowing that this is the path it's gonna take regardless of what I hear and see in the news. Because I assume by now, maybe I shouldn't assume, that most of us understand what we see in the news and what comes up generally all over our news feeds, Google feeds, whatever feed it is that you're on, has already more or less been factored into the market and it's really out there just for the everyday person. Unless we understand a bigger piece of the puzzle, 
I don't think we're going to make it further forward than the average Joe. At least that's my experience and my opinion, which is why I've dug a little bit deeper and this stuff takes some time to go and research. That's life. If you wanna get ahead, obviously we've got to research. I think most of us can agree on that. Back to some of this noise out there, it is completely no dig at the people themselves. I think they're great people. They probably have a much better work ethic when it comes to YouTube than I do. These guys are pumping out literally, what, seven or eight videos per day. That takes a ton of work. So don't get me wrong, I think they are doing an excellent job. They research what they do, they believe in what they do. I, I really genuinely dig their vibe, like what, what's going on. All I'm talking about here is the overall theory. And I think that's a healthy thing to discuss, especially you know, if I could sit down and talk with Kevin himself, I think that'd be an awesome thing. Like, wouldn't you like to go and sit down and talk with someone just about the economy or about finance and have a bit of a discussion, have differing opinions and share what it is you believe and how you wanna move forward. That's the way I work. You know, I've got quite a few people in my network all around the world, Australia, overseas, and they have slightly differing opinions to me on how these things should work. And I love to bounce my ideas off them. So I digress for a third time, but I think it's really important to distinguish between having a go at someone because you dislike them personally and just discussing their overall ideology for the market. And I guess the practice of how much information is actually out there, like how much of this is actually worthwhile and how much of it is just stuff that you want to put out because you enjoy talking about it. For me, look, if I was in this position, yes, I would probably be putting out a lot more videos because you can see from each of these videos, I can only imagine it's probably hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars per video when you estimate per thousand views could be 20 US dollars or 30 US dollars per thousand views. $30 multiplied by 100,000 views, that's about 3,000 US dollars per video that gets 100,000 views. Not to mention when people click on one and go and watch the rest of them. That is massive money. I like I see that as huge money. I don't if you think you're making more than 20 grand a day from just putting out a few videos and you don't think it's good money, I, I don't know. Maybe you're on the wrong channel. So I'm editing the video right now and I realize that 20 grand a day equates to about seven million dollars a year. Now I don't think Kevin is making seven million dollars a year from the YouTube channel. If he is, amazing. Honestly, I want to do the same thing, right? Uh, but the main point I'm making here is that producing news, producing media, if I produce more videos myself, which do well, like Kevin's do, then there is an incentive to continue to produce more videos, which is financial, you know? So each video is producing a lot of money. Maybe it was, my calculations are out, maybe it was more like a thousand bucks a video, but we can see from guys like Graham Stephan, and he tells us everything that he earns. You know, last year was around $2 million. Yes, maybe it wasn't all from AdSense, but again, point being is to continue to make content and you continue to get paid. So there is an incentive to produce more news, more media than we actually really need. So the point is, let's try and cut through the noise. I'm not having a go at creating more of the noise. It's our job to cut through it. And the content that's out there that people are producing uh, can be valuable for anyone. It might be valuable for one, but not valuable for the next. They're just making the content and people are enjoying it. Look, if I'm in that position, I will probably do the same, but I want my content to be as valuable as the previous piece. Back to the main video, that was the point I wanted to make even clearer there if I hadn't already. But before you get back to the main video, be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already. Much appreciated. Let's see if we can get these videos up to a thousand bucks each. We can see here from Kevin's videos that he is putting out one, two, three, four, five. There are about five videos for just today. That's not to mention the previous day, one, two, three, four, and the day before, one, two, three, four, and the day before, one, two, three, you get the deal. There's about four videos a day, all at around two to 300,000 views. I don't know exactly how much it is he's making from these videos or where the money's going, but there is another incentive to be putting out information. That's essentially the point I'm making here is it's a really tricky balance between putting out genuine information that's going to help and then obviously making money. And look, I am not digging at that whatsoever. Look, like I said at the beginning, if I was in this position, I would probably be doing the same thing again because after all, you're on this channel to learn about finance, you want to make money. This is an excellent way to make money. You're just reporting on certain information that is out there already, giving your opinion. 200,000 people are watching it. 
you're making three to six grand per video. Potentially, I could be way off, but even if it was one tenth of that, I think that's pretty decent money if you're putting out three or four of those a day. So it is a pretty difficult game to try and break through the noise. You know, like that's half of my day is just breaking through the noise. And I'm sure if you don't have as much time as I do, that is a really valuable thing to you is your time. So if you're trying to at least get started and make some money in investing or you're sort of into it already, trying to find a very credible source just to keep coming back to is the majority of your time. So I'm gonna move over to someone else here. Maybe you guys haven't heard of him, but I follow a few that are on the other side of the fence that aren't so mainstream, and they look at stuff like, you know, the, the market is going to crash and this is the end, you know, like this is the doomsday end of the economy, the end of the US, right? So I've got a guy here like George Gammon, uh, I heard a few good podcasts, so he's got a, a few differing opinions on there. Now, I'm not quite sure what their strategy is in terms of making money, but again, you can see they do make some pretty good views on their videos, especially for the number of subscribers that they have. Yeah, these are between like 13,000 for the recent videos, 50,000, 40,000. You've got some pretty good numbers here and you would be making a reasonable return on your AdSense as well. Now, of course, these are mostly doomsday type videos, so fear sells. Look, that's just another thing that I've noticed in the news. I think we're aware of that now that fear sells. So you keep putting out fearful news, give some sort of advice for what people could do to prevent getting themselves swept up into this doomsday cycle and, you know, talk about gold and some Bitcoin so that people can feel a little bit better about themselves after watching something that is quite miserable. Again, this has got nothing to do with the person themselves. I think they're doing a fantastic job. I love the channel. There's so much effort in the thumbnails and the content and getting these uh, interviews like that takes a ton of work. All I'm talking about here is trying to learn how to cut through the noise of what the media keeps pushing out to us. And we're all in the media. I'm putting out content. I'm part of the media now. If you are enjoying the video so far, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. I know many of you are watching the videos without being subscribed. God forbid. Hit the subscribe and like, you know, it helps the channel out, helps push the video to more people to see this content for free. So if you're appreciating it, I would also appreciate that. Let's get back to the video. One more YouTube channel I just wanted to show here is Mike Maloney. Some of you guys have, may have seen him before. Quite a big channel, 500,000. He's been going for some time. Quite similar to the George Gammon YouTube channel where they talk about the doomsdays here and the end of the world and get into gold and Bitcoin. And, you know, they're giving you all of the data to show why this should happen. Remember, these guys did this in 2008 at the GFC and said this event, the world ending, should have occurred back then. So, you know, we're 10, 11, 12 years on from that point. It hasn't occurred. Now they're saying it should happen again. This is why we need the economic cycle theory that I'm looking at here. I'll just put it up again quickly. Obviously, this is my opinion and I've been following this, so I've got a bias towards this working. Well, at least I've seen it work myself. And the beauty about this, well, what I love about it, is that it doesn't tell you that the end of the world is every year. It says, this is the time in the market, in the cycle, when we're going up. This is the time that is around the top. This is the time where it's falling through the mid of the major cycle. And this is the winner's curse, which is the big, the big boom at the end. And then this is the major crash. This is the time that you need to have all your money into cash or you know a fair chunk of it so that you can start to look at uh, opportunities coming up. So it incorporates all of those conditions within a market, a bull market, a bear market, sideways and some dips. So it's not just taking one side or the other. That's why I connect with this. Uh, you guys should probably look into it too if you're finding that this information resonates with you. Otherwise, you know, it's no skin off my back if it's not something that uh, you enjoy or that makes sense to you, uh, or if you need a more theories around different studies and research into data, like that just isn't me and that's not how I look to invest and it doesn't work for me. Uh, I prefer this to understand cycles and to understand uh, human emotion and how that affects us in the market. You can go another level deeper to that, which I won't get into here because that kind of sounds like way too woo woo if we get into that. but. You can read about it in the book or I'm happy to talk about it offline. Maybe I will make a video about it in the future when I've studied it and learned about it a bit more and can talk uh, with more ease about it. But for now, this cycle makes a hell of a lot of sense and I've seen it happen already through one half of the cycle. So that gives me a little more faith and belief in the system. So how can you use my little ramble there about understanding news and noise and good and bad and connecting it to the cycle? 
The way I see it is the different period that we're in in the cycle. Like I mentioned way back at the beginning of the video in regards to good news and bad news, right? So we're at the point in the cycle now around phase three to phase four, or actually on the way down to phase four. Phase three was the top of the first half of the cycle and phase four is the bottom. So we're somewhere in the middle there trying to figure out whether we've still got another period to fall to get to the bottom or we've seen the bottom and we're just sort of playing it out and just waiting out time until we can start heading up again. So at this point in phase four, what we usually see here is that there's nothing inherently wrong with the system itself. Although most of those guys will tell you something is wrong with it. Now how I connect those again is that I look at their history and what are they basing it on and they've been calling it forever, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years that the US should have fallen by now, yada, yada, yada. So look, I'm not gonna waste more time on that. I understand that there wasn't anything that different to what's going on in the system now that there was six months ago before uh, COVID. And I also understand that a fall in the market has to be from the land prices being over the top. And now that's another thing to get into in itself, but this crash didn't stem from land prices being overvalued. As much as I think land prices in Sydney, Melbourne, anywhere, any other major cities around the world are really high, they're not as high as what they could be. And yes, it's crazy to sound, we can talk about that in another video. That's why I'm still looking at this as phase four. So what I'm doing with the news is that we hear bad news all the time, but the bad news isn't really having that much of an effect on the market at the moment. That's why I believe and why I can see we're in the middle of the major cycle, the major 14-ish year cycle, and that this is another beautiful buying opportunity. Hopefully I've been able to connect those for you. We've got the noise and how to read through it, understanding where we are in the cycle, and then putting those together and what action we can take. Now, of course, I'm talking about a property cycle, which is also connected to a stock market cycle. Yes, there's a lot going on here, but if we don't have the income or the funds to be able to buy property, we have the stock market and we could start to invest in stocks that are related to property because I'm expecting to see a pretty big run in property prices in the coming five or so years. We're at 2020 now, probably expecting this to go into 2025, 2026, maybe 2027, that could be the end. But if we don't have the funds to be able to purchase our own bit of land, where I believe the major gains are gonna come from in this picture, besides crypto and Bitcoin, of course, but again, that's another story. We've got so many things going on to blend into our portfolio. And with blending it all, we are looking at purchasing something in the property space to go into our stock portfolio. So we're getting a bit of both there. We're getting the property and we're in the stock market so that we can have a liquid asset should time come that we need to sell. Property is great, but of course it takes a lot more time to sell a property if we've got it, you know, we've got to list it, we've got to wait for the unconditional period, we have to wait for settlement, and then that's the point that we can actually get out. So it could take a month, could take two months, it could be much quicker and get a cash buyer. But look, at the end of the day, the stock market is another great way to get in if you don't have the funds to be able to purchase your own property. So we're looking at stocks in the property sector around building, around uh, property ownership and property that's in the commercial space. So there's a, a good chunk of property stocks that we could be looking at and which I'll touch on in future videos. All right, this video has gone on long enough. That is the stage of the cycle that we are currently at. I hope I've given you some insight into how I look at the market and assess the different news that's out there and then play it into the cycle itself so that I can be assured and stress-free when it comes to my investment decisions. I will have future cycle updates and I'll probably touch on it quite regularly as well. I think it's important to keep track of where we are in the cycle. So stick around, be sure to subscribe and like the video if you found this useful. Yes, I always have a lot of cryptocurrency content on the channel as well, but I think it's important to understand all aspects of the asset market and use the assets that you enjoy. Like I enjoy cryptocurrency and I enjoy understanding the economic cycles and I can also invest into stocks. So I've got to use the assets that resonate with me, not just because someone on the internet says this is the best. Although that's what I tend to say about Bitcoin, but of course, it relates to me and I resonate with it. So that is the major thing that I tell people when they ask, not financial advice, what should they invest in? And I'm like, if you're not interested in it, it's never gonna work for you. All right, that's my ramble today on my portfolio, the market, noise and the economic cycles. Stick around for more of this content. You know where to catch me on Facebook and Instagram, links are down below. 
I'll see you guys at the next video for more fun on the economic cycles and cryptocurrency. Until then, remember to have more fun and get more done.